So let's get down to it. In the aftermath of the September 15 signing of the Abraham Accords, the normalization between Israel and the UAE and Israel and Bahrain, perhaps we are witnessing the emergence of a new Middle East, a profound paradigm shift, the acceptance of Israel's legitimacy in the region, the Abraham Accord, recognizing Jews and their state Israel as a member of the family of Abrahamic peoples, native to the Middle East. So the older Arab-Israeli conflict may indeed be coming to an end, even while there is growing concern about other actors in the region, be it Iran or Turkey and their various allies and proxies. And it's a concern felt not only by Israel, but by much of the Arab world, all of whom are increasingly sharing common security interests. And while the Palestinian issue remains far from being resolved, their veto power and Arab normalization with Israel is clearly broken. But the new developments still have the potential to encourage uh, the Palestinians to come back to the negotiating table for a serious compromise uh, in the future. So that's why, uh, friends, it's so refreshing that, and we're so grateful that Ambassador Sabusi has graced us with his participation this evening to ex further explain his government's thinking on this historic accord and his expectations uh, for the future. Indeed, we see really day by day, very heartening developments. Just yesterday, we saw the foreign ministers of the UAE and Israel, Abdullah bin Zayed al Nahan and Gabi Ashkenazi meeting at the Holocaust uh, Museum in Berlin. But tonight, Ambassador, we look forward to your opening remarks and then certainly exploring these dramatically important developments with you in conversation, which will follow. Ambassador, the screen is yours, welcome. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Colin, for these incredible kind words. You know, I was uh, so touched by uh, the incredible warmth uh, 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 of your reception and uh, your generosity and, and the faces that I see in front of me. Um, I'm truly thankful for Ajak for uh, reaching out to me and uh, organizing this event today, tonight. Um, it's an honor uh, to be the first uh, representative of the UAE to Australia, able to discuss such important topics uh, with AJAC. And of course, our distinguished uh, guests, uh, you know, uh, uh, who have made the time uh, to tune in uh, and be with us uh, today. The support uh, of the Israeli embassy, of course, uh, is much appreciated. Uh, there is no doubt of the importance of what brought us together today. Uh, we all have seen the historic event with the UAE-Israeli peace deal. Years ago, I used to joke with my friends, you know, when talking about uh, prospects. Uh, for peace in the Middle East, uh, and that it will take uh, an alien invasion to bring everybody together, you know. Um, but but sometimes it becomes possible, and then the possible becomes uh, actual, you know, uh, uh, under the right leadership. Uh, might I say, uh, unlike the deal, let's all hope that. Uh, the devastating COVID-19 does not make it into 2021. But, uh, you know, I digress. Uh, there is uh, no doubt that the peace deal will fundamentally change both uh, the UAE and Israel uh, relations, as well as the entire Middle East for the better, I'm sure. Uh, it brings new day. It brings a new day where uh, old and outdated antagonisms are swept aside in favor of peace and friendship. Uh, the deal will lead to uh, uh, a new uh, educational, cultural, and personal ties, uh, such as these ones, that will deeply enrich our peoples and lives. Uh, we will undoubtedly talk about this topic in greater detail later. But now I'd like to, if you allow me just a few minutes to talk about a topic close to my heart, 
uh, tolerance and interfaith understanding. Um, as some of our audience here today might be aware, the UAE has announced uh, the Abrahamic Family House, an initiative that aims to end the use of religion as justification of war, uh, violence, and, and harm, and opposes uh, extremism in all its forms. The Abrahamic Family House is an interfaith complex currently under construction in Abu Dhabi, the capital of the UAE. The design of uh, a church, a mosque, a synagogue, and a secular uh, welcome center, all together in one shared site. Uh, we believe uh, that the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are united by the belief uh, in God. And all three share in a history connect, connected to uh, the patriarch, uh, Abraham, may peace be upon him. This initiative is a pillar for peaceful coexistent and with no doubt uh, is a, a practical example of interfaith dialogue that will result uh, in uh, constructive and, and positive interaction between peoples and nations. Uh, of course, the interfaith institution was brought into being by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, the Prince of Abu Dhabi, uh, in February of uh, 2019. Uh, after uh, last year, historic visit of His Highness uh, of His Holiness Pope Francis. Uh, to uh, Abu Dhabi. And right after the, the meeting with the, the Bob, His Highness allocated a plot of land on Saadiyat Islands in Abu Dhabi. Uh, this is where the Louvre sit and many other distinguished in, uh, organizations or institutions. Uh, uh, you know, and on September 20th, uh, that same year, the design of uh, celebrated architect uh, Sir David Ajay uh, was unveiled in New York as the winning uh, design. His elegant designs of three cubic uh, temples representing each Abrahamic faith incorporates the value of the house into the design seamlessly. Each of the three houses of faith will stand at the same height to symbolize, symbolize uh, equality. Each is joined by a common courtyard to form a common meeting point, both physical uh, and uh, physically and symbolically. Um, and the site includes space not only for worship, but also exhibitions, program, conference, conferences, and of course, interfaith dialogue events. I should note that the UAE did not become tolerant. Uh, uh, you know, uh, in 2019, which by the way, uh, is themed around tolerance, but the UAE was built on religious tolerance out of both visionary wisdom and necessity. You know, when the UAE was formed back in 1971, we lacked, uh, we're very isolated, vulnerable. Uh, we lacked uh, security infrastructure and even basic services. It was the strength and the vision of uh, Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan Al Nahyan, who welcomed the foreign uh, foreign experts and workers, regardless of culture or religion, to ensure the country's future. Sheikh Zayed was always de a devoted Muslim, one who believed all human beings are brothers, regardless of belief. As he said, it uh, the true Muslim is a fr uh, is friendly to all human beings and a brother to other Muslims and non-Muslims alike. This is because Islam uh, is a religion of mercy and tolerance, His Highness, may he rest in peace said. Of course, he's the founder of the UAE. The mission of the Abrahamic family house will be uh, to enhance uh, understanding about all faiths and nationalities and reflects the UAE firm belief that faith, understanding, uh, and tolerance um, is a core element of, of global and regional st stability, increased uh, collaborative opportunities of all kinds, expanding economic prosperity, strengthening international relations, uh, countering violent extremism, 
cross-cultural education, and of course, peace. We can all see from the uh, from this uh, the seeds that led to the UAE Israel peace deal. This deal, a prime reflection of our belief in tolerance, the acceptance of differences, and the desire of peaceful coexistence. My wish is that uh, the design of the Abrahamic family house comes not only to represent uh, aspiration, our aspiration, but our reality. All three faiths joined in friendship, respect, and harmony bound by e equality. The Abrahamic house is the unprecedented concept uh, that uh, brought forward by the UAE where the for the first time in history, our three religions are represented, represented equally together under one entity in which Christians can find the church to perform their prayers. The Muslims have a mosque in which they perform their rituals and the Jews have a synagogue in which they worship. I cannot describe to you, Colin, uh, and dear listeners, uh, the first time I heard Jew a Jewish prayer. And and it was uh, and wasn't really sure if it was from the Quran or not. Uh, th this uh, this proves that to the world that the UAE is doing the best to promote values of tolerance, peace, uh, as His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan said, and and I quote: "UAE is a nation of tolerance, peace, um, cultural diversity, and." Coexistence. Thank you. Colin, back to you. Okay, thanks very much, Ambassador. Thanks very much for covering so many important uh, issues and uh, doing so in such an encouraging way. Uh, perhaps I, I could start by just asking you to elaborate a little bit more on uh, the uh, high hopes that the Abraham Accords have raised in terms of the areas of cooperation that might develop between the UAE and Israel in particular, obviously economic, uh, high tech, uh, and so on. Could you give us your perspective regarding what those areas uh, might be and where you think the cooperation might be the most fruitful? I think, you know, the ACR represent uh, an opportunity uh, to seize upon the region's potential, where 65% of the population is under the age of 35. Our nations look forward to strengthen joint cooperation in various sectors, including uh, health, uh, technology, uh, energy, tourism, uh, education, uh, already the UAE and Israel are engaged in, in discussions on cooperation regarding COVID-19 vaccine development to expand and intensify research and treatment on the coronavirus. Uh, as well as, you know, uh, working groups are, you know, making progress on a range of bilateral cooperative initiatives across key sectors. You said it best, you know, there is all, it seems like every day is something. Uh, and I'm really astonished by how fast we are go we're moving forward. You, I think there was something very significant in the energy area that happened in the last few days as well. Yes, I've seen it. Uh, uh, in many areas, really, the, you know, the energy, uh, uh, this, the, on the strategy, on the strategy between the, our Minister of uh, Energy and uh, his counterpart, and uh, you know, there are many interesting projects, and uh, and uh, really, uh, the possibilities are uh, limitless. Okay, so let me just uh, follow up there. Yeah, you know, talking here from uh, our Australia. I mean, the fact of the matter is that Australia and UAE have a very substantial economic relationship. Do you see any scope for some type of trilateral cooperation involving uh, the UAE, Israel, and Australia on the horizon? Um, absolutely. You know, there, there is uh, lots of room for synergy between the UAE, Australia, and Israel. Um, I believe the basis for that will be the, the cooperation that, co uh, that exists 
in a bilateral level between all three countries. And in, my, in my opinion, I see room for cooperation, cooperation in, in really in food and water security, you know, agriculture, of course, is a big theme, uh, science, technology. Uh, like I said, the, the possibilities are limitless. Just, just following up on, on that, uh, I mean, uh, do you really think uh, that, that Australia together with UAE uh, could also play uh, an even more active role in terms of promoting conflict resolution and dialogue, you know, ultimately, hopefully more peace in the Middle East in the, in the wake of the uh, Abraham Accord? And I note in particular that the UAE is a candidate for a seat on the UN Security Council. I, I truly believe uh, that Australia has uh, the potential to play um, a very large role in the area. Uh, you know, we have to look at, at, the, uh, at the cooperation that already exists between the UAE and Australia in the region. Uh, there is a long-standing military cooperation. There are Australian troops serving in Al uh, Manhad uh, Air Base, and we have. Uh, both participated in the international coalition to defeat ISIS, for example, and the international uh, maritime uh, security construct. Um, we share common values when it comes to fighting extremism, countering terrorism, and, and we share common interest in, uh, of course, in de-escalation of conflicts in the region. Uh, which will lead to peace and security in the Middle East. Uh, we hope uh, Australia continues to play that important role. Uh, Australia, you know, thanks to uh, the, the, the Australian government and the Australian people, uh, have a good credit everywhere. Uh, it's, you know, it plays a, a vital role on the world stage and the people trust what Australia has to say. And uh, we, we, we certainly hope that Australia continues to play that important role that helps preserve the peace and stability in the region. But speaking in general, you know, maybe you can, you know, share with me your thoughts about this. And it's very important, I think, and, and of course, Australia has been very supportive, uh, both the government and the opposition uh, uh, of the deal. Uh, I think in general, in general, and this is to, uh, to everyone outside, uh, you know, ev out there, it's very important not to send wrong messages uh, uh, just for being, you know, neutral or, uh, or for whatever reason. So uh, it's my hope that, uh, uh, that things can be uh, clear and, uh, um, uh, and the message from all countries is is is, uh, is continuously the same. Thank you. I, I I think what you might be suggesting, and I I can certainly say more explicitly that we hope that a number of Western countries, uh, I mean I think including Australia, uh, recognise the profoundly positive changes that are taking place and that some of the policies they're clinging to uh, may be uh, not in sync with these changes. I'm thinking about their ongoing support for the Iran nuclear deal, for example, and really the outmoded notion that the Palestinian issue, crucial as it is and needs to be resolved, nonetheless cannot stop the normalization taking place between Israel and the broader Arab world in which your country is such a leader. But maybe we'll come back to that. I just wanted to switch gears, and of course, I'm sure you join me in, in expressing our prayers for the speedy recovery from all, for all of the victims of COVID-19, from President Trump to his colleagues to everybody throughout the world. Uh, but I'd like to ask you in particular about the welfare of the people of the, of the UAE at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, the, of course, the global, global pandemic has had an impact in so many countries globally. And we all know that people who travel between countries present particular problems in public health. So maybe you, you could let us know how the public health challenge of coronavirus is impacting on the Emirates. 
and uh, you know whether or, or how optimistic you are for a return to the pre-pandemic situation, uh, you know, in the future or in the near future, hopefully. Uh, you know, the UAE, as, man, as well, I think, in many countries, uh, have uh, long identified the pandemic as one of the highest ex external risks it faces and has been regularly updating its pandemic planning over the, the past decade, uh, particularly after uh, experiences of H1N1 and MERS. Moreover, the UAE is committed to providing equal access to treatment to everyone uh, infected with the virus and supporting the most vulnerable communities through this crisis. This will extend to any visitor to the country who will have full access to our testing regime and health services. We have a huge uh, amount of capacity in our healthcare system uh, as we uh, as we built uh, a number of massive field hospitals, which are now empty, thank God. We have a large surplus of uh, ventilators, doctors, beds. We are still taking no chances though. For us, there is no trade-offs uh, between health security and the economy. We have been very cautious uh, reopening our borders and will continue to be vigilant with any uh, one coming in as we are with uh, residents and citizens. Um, I'm, I'm personally, I'm, I'm very optimistic. I'm, I'm, I'm going to vaccine uh, sometime in, uh, in December uh, and uh, volunteering to do that. And also my, uh, uh, just from my personal uh, circle, my sister-in-law took the vaccine uh, a while ago, and she's doing fine. She's doing great. So, okay, well, that's very good. We, we hope it works uh, for your sake and everybody else's. So, if I could just switch gears a little bit, um, the at the United Nations General Assembly uh, very recently, your uh, Foreign Minister Abdullah bin Zayed Al Nahyan, he noted uh, that the Abraham Accords were important uh, in progressing uh, towards peace because they represent a new framework, uh, particularly for the Palestinians to re-engage with Israel in a, in a very constructive way. Do you feel that the Accords will encounter, uh, encourage other states in the region to, to also recognize the value in the promotion of peace by having good relations with both sides uh, with their competing claims? And if so, which countries do you think uh, may emulate the UAE and Bahrain? Uh, in coming uh, to the table and normalizing relations in Israel with Israel and hopefully encouraging the Palestinian brethren uh, to join in and, with the negotiations. Wow, so <laughs> that's a good question. So we believe that uh, establishing relations with Israel will benefit not only if, uh, our two countries, but also the larger region and world and the world really. Uh, our ambition is uh, is a more peaceful, tolerant, and prosperous Middle East. We wish to see a two-state uh, solution for the Palestinian people and a substantial reduc a reduction in the long-term cycles and suffering. The region powers have the means to make that this happen, uh, and we think this. Accord is, is, a, is a major step towards all of these aims. Um, I think it's, it's really time for uh, new, new approaches and, and uh, new thinking to set a new and better path for the region. We must work together to expand community, um, um, a community of a peaceful uh, coexistence. This is through uh, broader regional dialogue, de-escalation and engagement. And we in the UAE hope this occurred is, is, a, is a first significant step uh, towards an, an era of security and prosperity. Our region currently experiences serious economic and environment challenges, all of which really require a great degree of cooperation and coordination. So you can uh, appreciate 
that we cannot hope to manage, let alone prosper, uh, if we are divided and lagging in terms of uh, product productivity and technology. I'm sure those sentiments will get a lot of support by uh, all the participants in tonight's uh, uh, webinar, but uh, could, could I perhaps just follow on by saying, or asking you really, uh, about the current Palestinian leadership, whether, whether it's capable of delivering the most desired outcome, whether it can be refreshed perhaps, whether it, be, it can really be persuaded uh, to have a rethink and to come to the table uh, for genuine negotiations and a genuine compromise, because, you know, it's obviously the case. There's certainly an appetite to do that on the Israeli side. There's an understanding that this is what needs to happen by your government, and I think by many other governments in the Arab world. What, what's your view on this? <laughs> Boy, this question gets really... So I think, you know, the UAE supports all good faith efforts. Let me put it this way. So we support all good faith efforts to find a comprehensive, just and lasting resolution to the Palestinian cause in accordance with the framework provided by the international law, UN resolution, of course, you know, the Arab Peace Initiative. Uh, the latter, which, you know, the Arab Peace Initiative was uh, uh, predicated on the two state solution uh, with the threat of further annexation that uh, uh, two, uh, the, the, the two state solution would be would have uh, most likely forever. The Palestinians uh, uh, and Israelis must now work towards a just and lasting resolution to the Palestinian cause, of course, with the support of the international community. This can only happen through good faith engagement by all parties. Okay, thank you very much for, for being so explicit and, and I think so balanced and, and very helpful in those comments. Um, your foreign minister at the UN in that address also spoke about uh, the expansionist ambitions of some states in the region and uh, called uh, to put an end uh, to the interference by those states in the internal affairs of others. Now, it's no big secret, of course, there is widespread concern in the region by the uh, behaviour and the involvement of particularly Iran, but also increasingly Turkey. Now, I wonder if you could, uh, without putting you in the hot seat, perhaps expand a little bit on these concerns and, and really what the international community should be doing about them um, from the perspective of the UAE. And uh, indeed, I reiterate that I think many Western countries you know, have been slow to recognize the profoundly positive changes taking place and still perhaps attaching too much faith uh, to, uh, you know, the Iran uh, uh, nuclear deal, for example, and delivering the goods when, in fact, of course, the outcome of that has certainly from, uh, from my point of view, I think from the point of view of Israel and many other observers, uh, the outcome has not been uh, what was expected. It's been problematic. Ambassador, what do you think? Well, I tried to be uh, blunt <laughs> because I don't think I can uh, uh, go on this. But I have to say that Turkey continues to play a disruptive role in the region, especially in its uh, attempts to undermine the security and stability of Libya. Uh, Turkish military activity in the Libyan uh, maritime region represents a clear violation of Libyan sovereignty and uh, also a violation of the international law and UN resolutions. Mm. The UAE remains strongly concerned over Turkey's support for terror groups and militias exploiting the security vacuum in Libya. But in terms of the, uh, the occurred, Turkey criticism is unfounded. Turkey, for, for instance, as you may know, has an embassy in Israel, welcomes more than 500,000 Israeli tourists each year. And, and the Israeli-Turkish trade amounts to $6 billion. Or we therefore find such criticism of the establishment of relations between the UAE and Israel, and Israel 
misplaced, to say the least. As for uh, Iran, the UAE remains deeply concerned uh, with the Iranian continued non-compliance with, with the limits established by the uh, G, uh, by the JCPOA. Moreover, the UAE is aware of the upcoming expiry of the UN arms embargo on Iran under United uh, Nations Security Council Resolution 2231. Uh, and I, uh, Iran must address concerns regarding its behavior and become res a responsible regional actor. The potential pursuit of nuclear weapons is acceptable and remains a red line in our region. The international community must remain engaged on these issues to encourage respect for and the compliance of internet with international law and resolutions uh, intended to foster stability and peace uh, in the region and, and in the world. Thank you, Ambassador. I, I think you mentioned a, a very worrying point that arms embargo on Iran really expires in the next few days. And of course, uh, Secretary Pompeo has been particularly outspoken and advisedly so about the dangers of that. But just to follow up briefly, one last uh, question for me before I hand over to my colleague, uh, Jeremy Jones. Um, there's been long-standing Iranian occupation of three strategically important islands, internationally recognized as UAE territory. I wonder if you could just say a little more about the current state of relations between Iran and the other states in the Gulf and, and, the, and the status of this worrying particular problem. Uh, our calculations are not unilateral or bilateral. They are multilateral. If the broader regional system is working and overall tension are uh, reduced, there will be fewer chances for the kinds of miscalculations and conflicts that spark wars. The current uh, agreement is entirely consistent with the UAE broader focus on de-escalation and confidence building through meaningful negotiation and uh, political uh, 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 processes. This has been our uh, stance with respect to practically all of the regional conflicts from Libya to Yemen. We believe that aligning more closely and openly with Israel and the US allow us greater stability to contribute to regional solutions. This occurred is not directed against Iran. Again, I'll say it. This occurred is not directed against Iran and it is up to Iran to decide how to engage. But as far as the UAE, we have made clear our stance towards uh, promoting peace and forging a more prosperous region where stability and security uh, flourish. Now, in regards to the UAE islands, which is a very dear subject to my, uh, you know, for five decades, the UAE has always exercised self-restraint in relations to Iran occupation of uh, of uh, of the of these islands, and has repeatedly called for a peaceful resolution of, uh, of the issue. Uh, however, none of its calls have been answered. Ambassador, thanks very much. And uh, for those very encouraging and enlightening and frank remarks, I appreciate them very much. But to deal with perhaps even more important uh, matters, uh, the Abraham House, the Abraham Accords, interfaith matters, on which you've already spoken so eloquently. I'll hand pass uh, the screen across to my colleague, Jeremy Jones, to pursue those important topics. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Now, visitors to the United Arab Emirates often go to see the world's tallest building. It's something they visit.
This week, at the bottom of the world's tallest building, there is a little temporary hut, a booth, for the Jewish festival of Sukkot, which we are currently celebrating. And uh, it brought attention to the small but long-standing Jewish community of the United Arab Emirates. I was wondering if you could say a little bit about a role you might see that particular small Jewish community uh, playing in furthering the aims of the Abraham Accords. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I missed the first part. I was, the, the question is, there is a small Jewish community in the Emirates. Yes. And the, the question is what role that small Jewish community could play in furthering the aims of the Abraham Accords. Uh, I think, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, the tolerance, uh, you know, the, we are sure that many Jewish visitors will uh, come to the UAE. It is, uh, it is worth noting that uh, a vibrant Jewish community already resides, like you said, in the UAE uh, and practices freely. And we also, you know, Rabbi uh, Yoda Serna was named the first chief rabbi for the UAE Jewish community back in, in 2019. Uh, you know, moreover, and I spoke about the, the Abrahamic family house, which was, you know, had the synagogue, the church and, and mosque on its premise. And, um, and uh, it's, it's gonna open, open very soon uh, in 2022. Uh, and will offer a space for prayer and reflection, like I said, for the country Jewish community, as well as the synagogues that already exist. We believe that the Jewish community will serve uh, as an, an important link uh, in connecting the UAE with the broader uh, Jewish world. And I, I, I'm sure you've seen this, uh, the, uh, the joint uh, 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 prayers and the joint uh, events uh, that between and um, all different fields, you know, not just religiously, but uh, and food sector and, 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 and different opportunities that uh, exploring the different opportunities that uh, that uh, this this treaty can uh, provide. I think you know uh, the Jewish com community will be th that uh, link. That important, like connecting, uh, not just with uh, but with Israelis, but Jews all over the world. Thank you. And in Australia, we feel we have the most developed interfaith dialogue of anywhere. We have good formal relationships of Jews, Christians, and Muslims, as well as other faiths. But particularly for this discussion, the Jewish-Muslim relationship is highly developed, has been going for many years, and I feel we have a model. We have experiences that we would like to share with you, and we would like to he share, hear from you about your experiences. And I was wondering if you think there is a uh, place for the dialogue from Australia to inform the dialogue in the United Arab Emirates and vice versa. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you, are, you have been, yourself have been a leader in this. And uh, I hope that we can meet uh, and soon in the future and talk about this further. Uh, but you know, in the UAE tolerance is a way of life and, and a key pillar uh, of the government. Uh, you know, this is through policies, interfaith dialogue and international partnerships. Our success as a country uh, is built on openness, inclusiveness and mutual respect and our, record uh, on tolerance speaks for itself you know the appointment of a minister of to of state for tolerance reflects the uae commitment to ensuring tolerance locally regionally uh, and we celebrated 2019 as the year uh, of tolerance you know we have uh, we theme years uh, behind the concepts uh, and you know the UAE is proud to lead the, uh, the region wide uh, indices in, uh, in uh, tolerance uh, toward uh, uh, foreigners year after year. Uh, you know, with more than two, and I've said this before, you know, with more than nationalities living together, the UAE is one of the most 
diverse countries in the world. As such, we believe we can play an important role alongside Australia, of course, in promoting a broader uh, culture of tolerance and interfaith cooperations worldwide, drawing upon the unique experience of our countries to foster uh, inclusivity and respect for religious uh, and cultural traditions. Furthermore, I'd like, Yanni, maybe we can talk about uh, how we can strengthen our, these communities against uh, the, the hate speech, against uh, extremism, uh, violent extremism speech, uh, uh, you know, uh, and I think, as, which I think equally uh, important. Thank you. Now, uh, we actually have in our uh, conversation online, some people from Indonesia who are involved in the tradition of Islam of Abu Rahman Wahid of Gustor, who really wanted to take to the world a different form of Islam than had been represented by those who have used it as a justification for intolerance and hostility rather than for positive human values. And I was wondering if, you're, uh, if you perceive the Abraham Accords as being a way of inspiring inclusive Muslims from around the world to be more proactive and certainly more public in their activities. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I didn't get your question, uh, so. Sorry. I was saying the Indonesian Islam. Within Indonesia, there is a tradition, a strong tradition of inclusive, moderate Islam. But there's also always a question of the battles within Islam between those who are exclusive and hostile to others as against those who have a, a positive, inclusive, constructive view of Islam. And I was wondering if you felt the Abraham Accords was, were going to be able to encourage moderate Muslims, inclusive Muslims, to be more vocal in the discussions within Islam and in global affairs. I hope so. I mean, we encourage dialogue as long as it's, uh, it's based on respect, it's based on uh, uh, respect for other people's uh, uh, beliefs. And I think, you know, many initiatives in that area uh, taken by, uh, uh, by uh, uh, you know, uh, different mechanisms we would to fight uh, uh, violent extremism and, uh, you know, extremism in general. I think this will play a role in it. Um, but I'd like to hear your point of view about it. Well, we, we would very, I think most of those in, the most of us in this discussion would look forward to uh, those people from various Muslim countries and Muslim communities who in their own countries, in their own hearts, in their own minds, really want uh, inclusive, constructive, positive, welcoming Islam, representing the best of Islam, to be the uh, public face, the representatives, yeah. what the public mind thinks of when they think of a Muslim. And I think we have uh, the seeds for this. The question is how they can grow from seeds into sort of a, a forest of, of wisdom. But I if I may ask you- well, We need to enable them, you know, we need to give them uh, the tools to express them, not only that, but to also to educate them, to, to try to spread this, uh, uh, this the, uh, the notion of, uh, acceptance or you know uh, find ways to use media social media different areas we need to have uh, uh, more ways we can connect uh, intellectually and uh, and uh, to be honest with you we need to challenge uh, the other side uh, because they somehow they managed to a creep in, 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 in popular uh, traditional media or on social media. I don't want to even start that. We can spend day, you know, hours talking about, about uh, how they control uh, social media. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, we need to be, I, I think this accord will help uh, uh, because I think we have experiences in, in trying to communicate this positive, uh, uh, thinking uh, all around and uh, 
uh, it's going to take away from uh, the, the more we meet each other and the more we have personal ties, we have face-to-face. -face. Uh, unfortunately, with COVID-19, it's, it's very hard, but, you know, this will suffice for now. Um, I think things will be better, and these guys, these people will be will be uh, will be empowered. We need to empower them. And on a different uh, subject, but related to civil society rather than the big political picture, many Australians have heightened awareness of the UAE since this country joined the Asian Football Federation. <laughs> We've seen the UAE as a footballing rival to be respected, and we always look forward to the great contests. We have heard that sport could be an important part in the soft diplomacy between the UAE and Israel. And we would very much like to know your views on the potential of sport to bridge gaps between peoples. And on a similar theme, we've seen musicians from the UAE and Israel begin collaborations. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the cultural scene in the UAE and what role it might play in building bridges between people. You know, my predecessor, Dr. Abed Kitbi, he's, uh, he's now the uh, former ambassador to, uh, to Australia and now assistant uh, minister for uh, uh, military and security affairs. He's a big proponent of sports diplomacy. He's quite the athlete, to be honest, and he's always, you know, running or on bicycle or something. And, and when I came in, everybody in the embassy were, were you know, either have participated in a marathon or did this or that, which is, uh, I'm more of, uh, uh, you know, of uh, someone who reads and, uh, and, 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 and thinks. And, uh, but, you know, I believe that uh, sports diplomacy, I mean, look at the Special Olympics, which we hosted last year. Uh, sports diplomacy is an, an important way to build uh, bridges between peoples and, uh, and open channels of communication. Sports are also of uh, major interest to many of the diverse nationalities that reside in the UAE. Um, you know, um, and we believe forging uh, bonds uh, over sports could help in strengthening ties between the UAE and, uh, and Israel for sure. I, I can I can uh, start you know imagine. Uh, you know, it's it's worth noting that the UAE previously hosted Israeli athletes in numerous games uh, and competition, uh, you know, barrier to establishing relations with uh, be between each other. But, you know, um, but regarding, you know, the cultural, if I want to move on. So regarding the cultural scene in, in 2020, the UAE, uh, ranked first uh, in the region and 18th internationally in the global soft power index. Uh, this is really a testament to the nation ongoing commitment to ensuring an environment of opportunity, uh, innovation, development and tolerance for all citizens, uh, residents and visitors to the UAE and uh, and ensuring, you know, um, the, the peaceful, you know, ensuring that the respectful, mutually beneficial, and, and peaceful relationship with the international community. Um, it's imperative that uh, countries work together uh, to build trust and understanding in order to successfully tackle global challenges together. Cultural and public diplomacy aids in eliminating, eliminating divisions and distrust between na uh, nations and allows the global community to work together in addressing challenges such as climate change, extremism, gender equality, of course, uh, and uh, education. Uh, we in the embassy try to uh, employ uh, 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 events or, you know, uh, these tools in our uh, outreach effort to the Australian people. Um, uh, uh, on the side, besides being an ambassador, I like to paint and uh, uh, I've been um, really uh, inspired by Aboriginal uh, 
sculpture and, and, and the paintings uh, and the symbols. And, uh, and so I created uh, this exhibition that hopefully will, will open soon, maybe in November. And I hope that everyone uh, listening to us can join us uh, in the opening or also you know, come anytime to see the, the paintings. Uh, and celebrate uh, this aspect of uh, 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 culture and uh, uh, and uh, the arts. Thank you. I'm sure we all are looking very much forward to that. I, I know I am personally very uh, keen to see the products of your uh, experience. Uh, the final question, though, what is your vision for the UAE in the global community in the year 2050? And the year, I'm sorry, what? I... Your vision for the UAE in the global community, a random year 2050, but you could have a vision oh, yeah. for 2025 if you like. Of course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I heard. <laughs> it's very close. <laughs> well, let me even go further into the future. So, uh, on December 15, yeah, December 15, 2019, His Highness Sheikh uh, uh, Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum the Vice President, uh, Prime Minister of the UAE and ruler of Dubai, uh, both with His Highness Sheikh uh, Mohammed uh, bin Zayed Al Nahyan, the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, and of course, Deputy Supreme Commander of, of the UAE Armed Forces, announced 2020 to, to be the year uh, uh, of preparation uh, for the next 50 years. So uh, like I said, I, I don't know if I explained this before, every year we, we try to rally uh, the country, the people uh, behind the theme. So a year of innovation uh, we had back in 2016 and the year of giving in 2017, which celebrates that the UAE per capita year after year now for the past seven years has been uh, uh, the largest donor country in the world per capita. Um, and um, uh, this year, uh, the 2020 is year to uh, the, the preparation uh, for the next 50 years is under the theme to 2020 uh, towards the next 50. Uh, the year 2020 will witness the launch of the biggest national strategy to prepare the country for the coming 50 years uh, and for the gold, golden jubilee celebration uh, uh, in 2021. So over the next, next 50 years, I'm very proud that the UAE leadership will work on making giant leaps in our economy, education, infrastructure, media, uh, to share the UAE new story with the world and, uh, and achieve our goal in making the UAE among the best countries in the world by the UAE centennial in 2071. Of course, the top priority um, of, of national work within the next 50 years will be placed on investing in talents and capabilities, strengthening our system of values based on tolerance, openness, and coexistence, and preserving our national heritage. Uh, customs and traditions. Uh, we will also uh, dedicate our efforts to remain at the forefront of uh, global competition and lay strong foundations uh, for the sustainable development uh, of coming generations. Thank you. And it's now my pleasure to invite the National Chairman of the Australia Israel Jewish Affairs Council, Mark Lieber AC, uh, to wind up tonight's proceeding. Uh, Mark, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ambassador, Your Excellency, what an honor it's been to have you join us for this historic gathering. I understand that AJAC is the first Jewish organization that you've addressed since the establishment of full diplomatic relations between the United Arab Emirates and Israel in August. We are most grateful to you for accepting our invitation and for the insightful perspective you've given us this evening. In fact, for the many insightful perspectives that you've given us this evening. 
To have you engaging with us in this way is a powerful demonstration of the significance of the new agreement, which is as much about the opportunity for people to people connections as it is about a vision for peace in the Middle East. It's about people like us all over the world speaking with one another, listening to one another, and all that flows from that, the business opportunities, the cultural exchange, the newfound focus on the many aspirations that we have in common. After all, what is peace for if it is not for the benefit of people and communities? Here in Australia, the Jewish community views it as a precious opportunity and we look forward to many more events like this one, hopefully held in person in the not too distant future. Once again, Your Excellency, please accept our heartfelt thanks for your wise, warm and generous participation this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all we have time for tonight.